Um, so it's a great pleasure to introduce my colleague in anthropology, Justin Dua, today. Um, he uh, received his PhD in 2014 from Duke University in cultural anthropology. Um, he is joined. He joined us in 2014 in the Department of Anthropology, and he, unlike many of us who work on the landmass of the subcontinent, he really works on the Indian Ocean. So he's interested in areas all the way from uh, Somalia and uh, all the way over to the subcontinental ports of all kinds, and then all the kinds of administrative, legal, financial arrangements which sustain those operations all the way. So we have <laughs> lots of, uh, he does lots of work in uh, London, place, talking to people at Lloyd's, for example, on, on insurance. So fascinating work. It's really part of, I think, a new interesting movement over the last, say, 10 to 15 years to really try to take in broad swaths of, of the um, region and to work between regions too. So that's his work is very innovative in that in that way. Um, he's published a number of articles, uh, and they all have colorful and intriguing titles. I'll just give you a couple here. Uh, actually, this one's not out yet, some of these, but um, one is Privateers and Public Ends, Piracy as a Global um, Moral Panic in the Atlantic and Indian Ocean. Uh, he has another called Making Property at Sea. Um, a, th a third is a Sea of Trade and a Sea of Fish, Piracy and Protection in the West Indian Ocean. So he, as you can tell from these titles, he works on piracy. And, and what's fascinating about his work also is that he, while not ignoring the sort of more sensational dimensions of it, he really does show the kind of prosaic aspects of uh, these operations from uh, the accounting practices in Lloyd's to the kind of daily cot chewing that happens while people wait for ships to come along that they can take. Um, He's also published uh, things in the media on this topic. He's published in both Al Jazeera and Internationalists, uh, uh, Pirates Life for Me, a uh, very intriguing title, as well as an op-ed in Al Jazeera. He's currently working on a book called Protection, uh, sorry, Protectors of the Sea, Piracy and Economies of Capture in the Indian Ocean. And he is, uh, has won s so many grants, basically all the major grants you can imagine. He's had them. And speaks uh, an embarrassing, astonishing, I'm just jealous to see the range of languages, Indian, Urdu, uh, Punjabi, Kishwali, Arabic, Somali, and even a bit of French for spice. Um, <laughs> so without further ado, please welcome Jonathan Dua. Thank you, Matt, for the introduction. Um, thank you, Farina, for the invitation. And uh, thank you all for being here today. So I will be speaking today about piracy, big surprise. Um, and uh, in particular, this emerges part uh, from the book manuscript that's currently in progress and, and focuses on a specific aspect of this world of piracy that the book uh, focuses on, namely the encounter between pirate skiffs and thous, this process called mother shipping. Nestled between two deserts, the arid coastal mountains of the Somali Peninsula and the temperamental monsoonal waters of the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean, the port cities that dot the Horn of Africa appear at first glance to be, in the historian Thomas Spears' words, to be strange foreign jewels on a mournful, silent shore. However, the sinews of trade and mobility that shape these borderscapes belie this vision of geographic isolation. A cursory glance at the historical archive highlights processes of moving and mooring that connected the seemingly desolate towns with worlds of exchange far beyond their hazy shorelines. And here I have a few renditions of these you know, maps. This is a vernacular map from 19th century Gujarat of the Red Sea that shows movements across the Red Sea, wind patterns in the Indian Ocean, and finally just a broader sort of sense of the swath of the Western Indian Ocean that I work on. As early as the fourth century AD, tales from the ports in the land of Punt appeared on papyrus in ancient Greece, compiled into the Periplus. These parchments describe a rich trading world shaped by wind patterns where the lure of Luban, or frankincense, drew traders from all across the world to ports like Berbera and Mogadishu. The uh, following the Periplus, the East African coast and Somalia appear in early Islamic works of the ninth century, including Al-Hamawi's Kitab Mu'ajam al-Buldan, a geographical dictionary that noted the importance of Mogadishu as a central trade emporia on the East African coast. By the first half of the 10th century, a ring of coastal towns emerged 
creating a world of trade along whose pathways traveled a dazzling array of material objects, free and unfree people, and a world religion, Islam. Vasco da Gama's entry into this world in 1498, facilitated by a mysterious local navigator, claimed by maritime communities from Calicut to Malindi, marked a shift from a regional economy, a world economy in a Bordelian sense, to a global one. Prior to Portuguese arrival, few European goods were in demand. The Portuguese brought silver from the Americas, thus connecting the Atlantic to the Indian Ocean world. A now largely discredited view also emphasizes this moment, what is called the Vasco da Gama epoch of Indian Ocean history, as marking the end of peaceable trade and ushering a melding of canon and commerce. However, as historians like Patricia Riso and Lakshmi Subramanian note, piracy and other forms of predation have been equally central to this liquid domain, with practices of armed escort, narratives of notorious pirate queens and kings, and coastal raiding communities, testament to the intertwined and slippery relationship between trade and raid. So if piracy, according to Bordel, is a child of the Mediterranean, it certainly had a kin in the pre-modern Indian Ocean world. In this talk, I propose the framework of protection to understand this commingling of trade and raid, of violence and intimacy, as well as the historical resonances that shape modes of engagement outside of frameworks of territoriality. Specifically, I focus on the recent cycle of maritime piracy in the Western Indian Ocean in order to highlight this world of protection. From 2007 to 2012, over 300 ships and 3,000 crew members were held hostage off the coast of Somalia. While global attention was transfixed by the capture of oil tankers and large container ships, the expansion of piracy in these waters, as we see here, a move from the Red Sea to the Indian Ocean, led to many more engagements between pirates and motorized dhows that sailed from port to port in the Western Indian Ocean. The use of captured dhows to expand the spatial and temporal range of this practice, a, a practice known as mothershipping, emphasizes the worlds of violence, threat, and hospitality that are constructed in these moments of encounter. Instead of a vision of the Indian Ocean that foregrounds long histories and cosmopolitan exchange, mothershipping is about forms of contact that are brief and overwhelmed by real and potential violence, as well as constituted by sanctuary and the mutuality of being. This is, in, in short, a story of protection. As an infrastructure of sociality, a simultaneous presence in relations of kinship, in claims between citizens and states, between guests and hosts, and as I hope to show here, between pirates and hostages, the giving, receiving, and contestation of what I term here as protection is central to understanding encounters in these slippery domains evoking both comfort and the ominous connotations of the mob, the protection racket. This dual-edged nature of protection has been noted by a number of scholars, notably Charles Tilly and others influenced by him. While for Tilly and others, this duality of safety and violation is part of a teleology of state-making. With legitimacy, protection rackets transform into sovereigns. This talk emphasizes the violence inherent in constructing forms of protection, and its simultaneous modes of hospitality as open-ended processes. As a modality of jurisdiction without sovereignty, extraction without production, and encounters across threshold, protection highlights the centrality of mutual recognition in shaping systems of sociality, economy, and law. Through thous transformed into motherships, this talk moves between a number of vessels at sea in order to construct this geography of protection. I begin with a brief discussion on maritime piracy before turning to the world of the Tao. In 2010, at the height of what could be understood at the, as the golden age of Somali piracy, I met my first self-proclaimed pirate. Farah had agreed to meet with me on a windswept beach in a small desolate fishing village in Somalia. Amidst the howl of gusty winds and rough surf, it was the beginning of the southwest monsoon the annual lull on piracy imposed by seasons, or vacation time, as far I would like to call, would call it, he highlighted his transition from fisherman to pirate. Farah explained, I used to be a fisherman in Ail, which is a town in northern Somalia, catching lobster, but also snapper and tuna. 
one, and these fish matter in the sense that these, this is precisely the valuation of these fish within regimes of consumption in beginning in the 1970s onwards that make then the waters of the Indian Ocean a specific place for extraction. So, and, you know, so, the, so, and ironically, lobster tuna are not eaten on, in Somalia. So there, there, there's always this sort of mode of thinking of what is value here and something that's not valued on shore but has value when it shows up in a restaurant, even in places like Ann Arbor. Um, a few, so one day a trawler cut our nets in the middle of the night when we were fishing not far from the coast. A few of us decided enough was enough and we boarded the boat. The captain was an Indian. We made him pay $1,000 to fish in our waters. And this is Farah continuing. We went back to the village and told everyone about it. Soon the boys started going out on fiber boats and chasing trawlers to get money from, fish, uh, from ships. This is how we became pirates. After a while, we started going after bigger fish. But the principle was the same. You find a ship and make them pay to be in our waters. When Farah and others took to the sea, there was a sense of surprise about this return of maritime piracy. As early as the 19th century, piracy had been consigned as a relic of an earlier time. Along with the transition from sail to steam, vast portions of the open ocean were increasingly regulated. And by 1924, the legal scholar Edwin Dickinson asked in the pages of the Harvard Law Review, is the crime of piracy obsolete? Unsurprisingly, it was a question he answered in the affirmative. As territorial states became the, nor became the norm in a post-1948 world, it seemed as if the behemoth had tamed the Leviathan. But in 1990s, piracy returned from the Straits of Malacca to Somalia. Shifting regulatory regimes, a proliferation of small weapons, legacies of the Cold War, a growing demand for fish, and the depeopling of global shipping together made the busy shipping lanes of Southeast Asia, Africa, and Latin America once again sites of predation, profit, and plunder. Off the coast of Somalia, maritime piracy emerged in the 1990s as a hijack and ransom economy. And this is what in some ways distinguishes piracy in Somalia from Southeast Asia and other places. Ships are held offshore, as you can see in that second picture, while ransoms are negotiated as opposed to theft of cargo. And, and so this, this idea of ransom and negotiation becomes deeply central, which is what in my larger work I talk about connects piracy to insurance markets as well as you know, these, these worlds of mutual aid within Somalia that create the financing that's possible to make piracy happen. So pirate, a pirate, you know, a successful pirate is one that can negotiate time in essence. So this ransom economy primarily targeted the fishing trawlers that came to this coast. But soon, as, as ransom payments increased, from fish trawlers, pirates operating into these waters shifted to cargo ships. From the low and slow cargo boats chartered by the World Food Program to bring food aid to Somalia, and finally, oil tankers. A consequence of this rise of piracy was that merchant shipping gradually abandoned their Somali roots, leading this import-dependent nation to turn to wooden dhows from South Asia, creating a circuit of trade, rein reinvigorating a circuit of trade from South Asia to Somalia via the ports of Dubai and Oman. The Latin, so in the next section, I focus on this world of the dhow. Commonplace from Mozambique to the coast of the Western, in, to Western India, the Dao is an embodiment of the dense trade networks of the Western Indian Ocean, and since the advent of European incursion, the object of its regulation. This regulation achieved its zenith in the 19th century with the attempted transformation of the Western Indian Ocean into a British lake. The opening of the Suez Canal had made European sailing vessels, specifically clippers that moved between London and China, obsolete as using tugs to transport them across the canal was both impractical and expensive. By 1870, the era of clippers receded and steam vessels reigned supreme over the lucrative Indian Ocean route. This transition from sail to steam in the Indian Ocean was a deeply racialized project. The sovereignty of steam was built on criminalizing the Dao. As the historian Eric Gilbert notes, the Dao trade was part of a larger colonial discourse of modernity and tradition exemplifying for the British the traditional pre-modern trading world of slaves and spices, that that was an anachronism in an era of free trade and steamers. 
The Tao economy was cast as piratical in the late 19th century, with European warships regularly patrolling these waters in search of pirates and assorted traders of disrepute. As it criminalized the Tao trade, the steamship, as writers of, kind of, you know, um, of the British Empire have written, also radically changed British ideas about self and the world. And here we have a map of the various steamship routes that began in the 19th century. And you see most of them overlay on older Tao routes, but also end up creating new linkages across the ocean, specifically between East Africa and India. So this is the moment of massive migrations to build infrastructure on, on the African continent. So through close attention to the journeys of a young s Scottish medical student, the historian Tamsin Peach notes, highlights how in the space of the steamship, you know, a, a new identities were formed, specifically a particular kind of British identity that collapsed the space of empire, elided difference among Britons, and extended the boundaries of the British nation. This was, however, not a totalizing project. The Tao continued to operate at the margins of this Indian Ocean economy, and steamships and later railways loosened societies of the Indian Ocean Rim from the rhythms of the monsoon in ways that made many kinds of mobilities, not just British mobility, but others possible. Since steamships serviced integrated distant reaches, such as Natal in southern Africa, into older networks, coal can be seen as effectively expanding uh, what was the Indian Ocean region. Additionally, steamships required coaling stations along the route from Suez to India, reviving old port cities along the Red Sea coast. So some of the port cities that I work in reemerge in the 19th century as essentially providing livestock for Aden and other major coaling points. So there's, there's both this longer history, but also moments that I want to highlight where you know, these cities get tied up into various kinds of structures, in this case, the structure of steam. Just as important, railways stretched far inland, linking port cities with small communities and burgeoning settlements across the interior. The temporalities and spatial geographies of steam created new forms of mobility that built on older ones of the sail and spun together places, texts, and persons in meaningful narratives of travel. One such example, in 1896, Kasul Anakoda, a ship captain on a Tao, that sailed regularly between Karachi and Kenya, decided to switch from sea to land. Abandoning his crew and the Tao in the port of Mombasa, Kasur headed inland to join his fellow South Asian migrants who were working on the Kenya-Uganda railway line. In a letter written to the financier of the boat, Kasur explained that British surveillance and the competition for ste from steamboats had made his work too difficult. I do not want to be considered a slaver, he writes, while reassuring the financier about the safety of the cargo and the prowess of Ismail, his former second-in-command and the new Nakoda of the Tao. Kasur, as I follow him through the archives, ends up in eastern Congo, his family expanding into some of the major cities of East Africa until they're expelled by Idi Amin. So there's a whole sort of cycle of mobility here that begins, in essence, with the shift from, or that is tied to this shift from um, sail to steam. So instead of rupture, what I want to highlight are these continuities. And the Tao moves between this world and survives the 19th and early 20th century attempts at regulation. But the onset of decolonization and the transformations wrought in the Red Sea and the Western Indian Ocean by oil, what Timothy Mitchell has called carbon democracy, seemingly struck a death blow to this transregional economy. Post-colonial nationalism along the oceanic rim, built on claims to land, earth, and soil, turned its back to the sea. This post-colonial lockdown, as Jeremy Presthold has called, led to the Tao and with it the ocean receding from view, fading into the realm of the nostalgic and the artisanal. The rise of containerized shipping and ever-increasing ship sizes in the 60s, and this is tied to the Vietnam War and the need to create what is called intermodal transport, the, the containerization movement, seamless transit from port to road via a box that is uniform. So this, this container revolution ironically brings back the Tao in the Western Indian Ocean in the 1970s, transformed this time into the fiction of the motorized sailing vessel. And to do this, let's turn to Gujarat now. 
on both sides of the Gulf of Kutch, in the shadows of special economic zones amidst the dredging projects for real and imagined container ports, are small port cities that have historically supplied the infrastructure, the boats, the credit instruments, and sailors for the maritime diaspora of the Indian Ocean. The reverberations of containerization, the rise of Dubai in the 1970s, and the first Iraq War stirred places like Mandwi and Salaya from the slumber of the post-colonial lockdown, and the Dao was refashioned into a vessel that operated in the underbelly of the logistics revolution. Functioning as an economy of arbitrage, this Dao, and these are very different, again, from the 19th to the, you know, from the 19th, so I wanted to give you a sense of the scale. These essentially are equivalent to small container ships at this point. The wooden boats that circulate in the Western Indian Ocean go today to places that container ships cannot or will not go due to expenses, port capacity, or security. Weighing often an average of 5,000 to 10,000 deadweight tons, these boats are essentially small bulk carriers with rudimentary sails. As the Dao captain in Mandui explained, I think we need to use our oars if we wanted to move. If we used our oars, we would move faster than if we used the sail. The sail exists as, as, a, as a legal fiction, a necessary <laughs> mode of regulation and classification. The label Dao today exists only for tax purposes because if you are a motorized sailing vessel, you are in a different tax regime as opposed to a motorized vessel, the MV versus the M MSV class. These are the two big shipping categories. So the Dao, so I'm interested in this idea of the rebirth of the Dao as a fiction. Beyond the structure of the boat, the world of the Dao is also framed by these fictions of the global economy. The collapse of the Somali state gave another boost to this new old economy of the Dao. Beginning in 1991, commercial shipping gradually abandoned the ports of Somalia, a process that accelerated with the rise of maritime piracy. An import-dependent economy, Somalia continued in the aftermath of state collapse to be heavily dependent on the sea for everyday sustenance as well as the odd luxury goods that make their way to port. Today, almost everything, with the exception of Kat, arrives by Dao. Bosaso, Berbera, Mogadishu, and Kismayo have become nodes of cheap trade connecting Somalia to a wider world. Not only providing port access, these cities function as outlets for the wider Horn of Africa, as tax-free alternatives to the port of Djibouti in the north and Mombasa in the south. Laden with bulk goods, arriving into the port cities of Somalia is a somewhat anachronistic experience. The buzz of the ports, the longshoremen milling about, and the familiarity and friendship between captains and port inspectors who bond over cups of tea and speak shared languages beckons perhaps to a time before the container and the computer. A world where goods are loaded and unloaded by hand, where the logic of logistics does not reign supreme over the networks, both fleeting and deep, that constitute trade relations. But to see this world as mere anachronism, as somewhat betwixt and between the era of port cities and container ports, is to ignore the just-in-time logics that constitute the global supply chains of Somali trade. It is to ignore the shifting nature of consumer demand and geopolitics that frame the impossibilities of certain itineraries. The Dao trade is simultaneously old and new, diasporic and local. So in my larger work, trying to understand this moving beyond both the language of informality, but also what is often done as a gesture of that is to say that the formal and the informal are deeply interconnected. Yes, they are connected, but primarily what's important about arbitrage economies like the Dao is that they depend on that distinction between formal and informal. Arbitrage can only exist if you have national ports, if you have tax regimes. So these aren't muddying necessarily the waters between formal and informal, but in some ways dependent on that system. So there's this, this logic of the parasite that I'm playing with throughout this piece, and I'll get to that later. So the idiom of the nation state is not evacuated from this trading world. National governments, regulatory policies, and interests continue to frame the sea of trade. So here we have the cattle pens and quarantine facilities that have to be set up to send ship primarily livestock that moves from Somalia across. You know, flag, state flags are flown, national sailor identity cards issued, taxes paid, receipts issued or evaded. Hannah Arendt's warnings on the need for a nation state to protect the right to have rights certainly rings true 
in the movement of people and goods across this oceanic space, where passports and sailor ID cards are just as important as genealogy to determine who belongs and who is rendered invisible and matter out of place. As piracy expanded in the Western Indian Ocean, for the most part, pirates and thous avoided each other, with pirates preferring higher value cargo ships and the potential for Western hostages and thus higher ransoms. Yet, on occasion, they encountered each other. These encounters became more frequent in the aftermath of the UN Security Council resolutions of 2008, specifically 18, UN Security Council Resolution 1816, which assembles the global war on piracy. Now, following the hijacking of the MV Sirius Star, the largest ship ever to be hijacked, the UN Security Council adopted a series of resolutions to construct the legal artifice for the uh, 21st century global war on piracy. Specifically, Resolution 1816, while respecting the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Somalia, gave unprecedented authority to international navies to pursue pirates in international waters, Somali territorial waters as well as land. So it erased any distinction between the high seas, territorial seas, and land that have been central to maritime regulation. Emboldened by this resolution, naval vessels started aggressively patrolling the sea lanes of the Gulf of Aden and the Red Sea pushing pirates further out into the ocean, specifically shifting piracy from the Red Sea to the Indian Ocean. As piracy moved from sea to ocean, it became a floating diaspora scattered across the Western Indian Ocean, with attacks occurring as close to 40 nautical miles off the coast of India. The Thou was transformed again, this time into the contemporary version of the 19th century mothership. During the height of the whaling boom in the 19th century, motherships were central to expand the reach of the whaling trade by functioning as bases from which smaller, faster cutters could be launched to chase and kill whales. The whale meat was then processed and stored in these larger ships, a practice that continues to this day where motherships are now called factory ships where st for storing and processing catch. For whalers, motherships were both floating factories, places of work and labor, but also ways of domesticating the sea, of extending what Nancy Munn calls the intersubjective space-time in these watery domains. Instead of a vessel that allowed whalers to travel far and wide in search of lumbering giants that illuminated the 19th century, whale oil was the fuel for this world, the Thou as mothership enables pirates to chase a different beast, the oil tanker that fuels contemporary globalization. The transformation of the Thou as mothership, and this is, when I say mothership, this is what I'm talking about is often small pirate skiffs that attach themselves, that take over a larger ship and use that to move throughout the ocean. So the transformation of the Thou as mothership extends space and time in the liquid domain of the sea. In addition, the Thou as mothership highlights another facet of the ship. In an inhospitable world, the mothership exists as a place of simultaneous refuge and violation, of hospitality and hostility. The final section of this talk focuses on this duality of protection as simultaneously constituted through the intimacy of violence and safety. In early 2010, seven Indian thous were hijacked off the coast of Somalia and over 97 seafarers held captive. In response, the Indian government attempted to limit the circulation of these boats and banned thous from sailing south of Oman. In spite of this ban, a steady stream continued traveling from Gujarat to the Arabian Peninsula and from there onward to Somalia. Rahimullah, captain from Kutch, recalled his decision to continue sailing in spite of the ban. This is our work, he said. It's always dangerous. There were many times when a big wave almost wiped us out. Anything can happen when you are at sea. So when the government restricted travel, we had to keep going. Goods aren't faithful to flags, which is, was a reference to the fact that if Indian thous stopped, there would be thous from Pakistan and other places who would come. Rahimullah and I were chatting on the deck of his Thou at a Somali port city as he awaited his cargo of livestock to take across the Gulf of Aden to Dubai. After a long pause, he told me his boat had been used as a mothership on at least two separate occasions. Recalling the moment of arrival when pirates appeared at his threshold, he explained, we had just left the port of Salakla. 
which is in Oman, when we heard on the radio that the Alibabas had been seen by someone not far from where we were. It was late at night, and all of a sudden, before we could head back, a skiff came alongside us and shot some rounds in the air. We slowed down, and they boarded us. They were lost and had run out of water for drinking and for their boat. They stayed on our dhow for three days, and then near Sukhotra, which is just off Yemen, they got off and disappeared. How do we understand this form of encounter? I want to suggest here that Rahimullah's story, this moment of capture, this fleeting relationship that was formed between the Dao and the pirate skiff, is one of protection. There's something jarring about imagining capture through the framework of protection. After all, what kind of relationship can exist between the enemies of all, as pirates are called in Roman law, and helpless seafarers? What form of hospitality is possible when one arrives at a threshold armed? This absence of a relationship between pirates and others has been a defining legal idiom through which to understand piracy. Historically, in Roman law, pirates were seen as enemies as opposed to criminal, so hostis as opposed to lardon, and specifically an enemy to whom no duties were owed. As Cicero notes, there is no perjury if the ransom for life, which had been agreed upon even under oath, is not paid to pirates for the reason that the pirate is not entitled to the rights of war, but is the common enemy of all mankind, with whom neither good faith nor a common oath should be kept. This, this idea of the common enemy has increasingly be, been expanded in an era of Guantanamo and extraordinary renditions, but this fundamental idea that pirates are those to whom no oaths are required continues to frame, surprisingly to me at least, the the various Somali captivity narratives that have emerged in the aftermath of this kind of upsurge of piracy. So these narratives faithfully replicate Cicero's idea that pirates are not owed any form of relationality. Written primarily by Western writers for Western audience, the framework of non-relationality is key in these narratives. So here I'm thinking of movies like Captain Phillips as well as a host of popular fictional accounts of oftentimes well-meaning journalists who show up in Somalia wanting to interview pirates and then are captured. And, and one of the things that happens in these, in these accounts is that they always begin with sympathy. They always begin with this moment of wanting to understand. And that sympathy over the course of capture transforms into condemnation. So most famously, Captain Phillips, this is capture of the, the capture of the Merce Alabama, fictionalized in Captain Phillips, the Hollywood movie, you know, replicates this to a T. In the beginning, when pirates appear at the threshold, the captain is willing to negotiate with them. He offers them money. He says, here's $2,000, take them and leave. We can have an, an interaction. But through, captivity transforms this. And the captain angrily declares at one point, you are not fishermen, thereby you know, exiting them from the world, this maritime world, right before the hijackers are in fact shot dead by the US Navy. So there's this point where one has to assert their criminality and justify this, the non-relationality between a pirate and oneself in ways that very you know, interestingly re are very familiar to Roman law. In contrast, the world of mothershipping that I'm talking about is built on a more ambivalent relationship. Moments of encounters between thou crews and pirates are certainly fraught with danger and potential violence. Crews are often threatened and mistreated, supplies stolen, itineraries disrupted, and losses incurred. Yet, when these tales are narrated, whether to other seafarers or curious anthropologists, in moments of waiting at port or in homes away from sea, stories of accommodation and of recognition are equally prevalent. Thinking through protection allows us to see these stories beyond mere ideology or a form of Stockholm Syndrome, and also signals the potential temporary reversals that occur in these moments of capture. Additionally, in thinking through protection, I'm working within a recent anthropological engagement with questions of hospitality. As anthropologists like Andrew Shryock, Giovanni de Cole, Matea Candea, and others have shown, beyond abstract scale-free systems of rights and obligations of citizens and non-citizens with clearly defined roles and notions of reciprocity, hospitality as an ethnographic project exists always as an object of contention, concern, and debate in everyday practice. It's this emphasis on the everyday that I wish to pick up here. Protection as a mode of engagement that is simultaneously about horizontal and vertical encompassment. 
It is about relationships with others who are equal and those who are not. Is tied to specific spaces and can be temporary and illustrates this emphasis on ethnographic specificity. So I want to return now to Rehimullah's story. So he begins with this idea of the pirate arriving at the threshold, lost, hungry, thirsty for fuel and water, while simultaneously armed. So there's already that ambiguity of hot threat and also a seeking of refuge. Shots are fired. This is clearly a moment of violence. The pirate arrives at the threshold, holds crew's ho the crew hostage through threat and the enactment of force. Yet in the hours, days, and sometimes months of capture, meals are also shared, movies watched in the intimacy of the hold. As numerous crew members noted, and after the arrival would be the moment when the pirates keep their guns away. This moment of disarmament does not structurally transform the relationship between thou and pirate skiff or create a form of equivalence between guests and hosts. Instead, the anxiety and potential violence of arrival is deferred through this acknowledgement of the weapon kept aside. Like Michael Saris's discussion of the parasite, the pirate has now taken residence in a system and engaged in a form of taking without giving. Mothershipping rechannels thou itineraries towards the world of containerized shipping in whose underbelly this arbitrage economy already operates. So there's already a scale of moving from the thou and its relationship to the container ship to the pirate skiff and its relationship to the thou. It both makes apparent the ways in which channeling and rechanneling create value at sea and at the same time make possible a brief temporary form of relationship. The AK-47 that's put away in a corner, the meals that are shared, the debates over the spice level, it's these, these kinds of details, and the Bollywood DVDs are the material objects that mediate this relationship of protection. Instead of a move from sympathy to disavowal in other piracy narratives, or even what Ashil Mbembe calls the conviviality of the, rural and, uh, the ruler and the ruled, we have forms of acknowledgement of temporary living together in the rocky hold of a ship. When I asked Rahimullah of his relationship to pirates, there's this a moment where he said, and this is repeated by other crew members, Ham sab garib log hain, we are all poor, transforms the enemy of mankind into a fellow traveler at sea. Like Aristotle's oikos, piracy in this watery expanse is thus transformed briefly into a natural mode of acquisition. These everyday encounters are moments when identities of hijacker and hostage of pirate and merchant are transformed and reconfigured, though importantly not dissolved. Rahimullah always referred to his hijackers as Alibabas. Other crew members would seek to reason these acts within an Islamic moral universe of haram and halal, of Gaza. The idea is this a raid, is this justified? And there's always this, uh, there, there is a both a moment of recognition but also a distancing that happens within this frame. Often there's incomprehensibility of language. And that's something that's marked. This, these encounters that often last up to months happen in mediated through Bollywood in many ways, through the kinds of vocabulary that are picked up by these sailors who share a certain you know, sort of literary archive, so to speak. If the pirate skiff appears as an object of danger and intimacy from the vantage point of the Tao, what about the view from the pirate skiff? This view is also I argue, one of ambiguity. Alongside being mediated through material objects, protection is a jurisdictional claim tied to persons and places. In 19th century Somalia, the practice of aban was a guarantee of protection in return for payment for the duration of time that, uh, time that one traversed through space that the protector claimed as one's own. Similarly, as Tom Lambert has shown in medieval England, the practice of sanctuary recognized churches in analogous ways to men's homes as spaces of protection and peace. So these are not space, these are temporary relationships. These are not spaces of territorial sovereignty, but rather control over bodies, over people who are claimed as protected. From the vantage point of the pirate skiff, the Tao emerges as sanctuary that operates on two simultaneous scales that I illustrate through the stories of Jafan and Hawil. A former pirate turned stevedore, Jafan recalled his encounter with the sanctuary of the Tao as a sensorium of protection. We had run out of food. I was really seasick, he said, when we, when we were talking about his encounter at, with the Tao. We thought we would die. 
Then we saw Vahan, the Indian Val. We captured that boat. As soon as I got on the boat, I was better. It was bigger, and there was no smell of diesel. It was the best part of my time at sea. So this is, this is, a, this is a sanctuary that's mediated through a sensory relationship of protection. In opposition to the sensorial experience of protection, indexed by the absence of seasickness and diesel fumes, Hawil's encounter with the Dao is one that works at a distinct scale, a different scale. He begins, when we first saw the Dao, I was worried it was a jinn. And this is a common theme within this encounter. Both pirates and Daos encounter each other often in this moment of ambiguity. Am I seeing jinns or am I seeing other boats? And this is something in the larger project and sort of developing this, this idea of a shared moral universe where jinns and other non-human energies animate this relationship. When we got on the boat, I was pleased, Hawil said, that the crew was Muslim. I could perform salah instead of just offering dua from the skiff. So there's a different orientation pr pr practiced primarily amongst communities along East Africa of distinction made between a certain ritual prayer that requires wudu being clean and performing salat versus supplication, which can be given without being in a state of ritual purity. So, so this moment, so at my, my conversation with Hawil revolved around what the Tao allowed him, which was a space to be on Friday to perform Juma prayers. So the Tao transforms here into a mazar, a, a site of pilgrimage, a space of that one moves back and forth between and so these very different temporal these very different temporalities, these very different scales within which the Tao operates of, as sanctuary, as sensorial, as spiritual, are key to this narrative of protection and the ambiguities that I want to highlight. Protection is embodied and oriented towards various scales at the same time, and always a reminder of the human and non-human energies that animate mobility in the oceanic realm. But to conclude, not all forms of scale jumping are possible in the Indian Ocean. The Western Indian Ocean is not just a space of dows and pirate skiffs and a shared moral universe. There are other ships at sea. The story of catch and release and naval and, and pirates' encounters with naval vessels highlights this problem. In 2009, there were rumors that if one approached a naval vessel without weapons, one would be eligible for asylum. This led to many pirates targeting you know, specifically naval, navy, navy vessels. And, you know, and in the case law, there's always this moment of incredulity when, when you know, the seafarers at, in this navy ship see small skiffs approaching them. And you know, in this moment, protection would be asked for, the protection this time of liberal recognition of asylum. And instead of that protection being given, a policy developed of what was called catch and release, where pirates would be disarmed their, their supplies taken, they're given maybe five days worth of food and water and left out to shore. And this is the bare minimum this, uh, in according to legal norms on the obligation to provide assistance at sea. So here when the pirate skiff encounters a, a legal liberal regime, we realize where this notion of protection both continues, sustains itself, but also starts breaking down in the non-recognition by the Navy vessels of the kinds of you know, modes of protection that are articulated. Within this framework of geopolitics and long histories, a world of drones and post-Panamax shipping is the continuing presence of protection that I have sought to draw out today. Alongside contests over sovereignty and value, this world of protection is constituted through a slippage between violence and safety. It is in these everyday forms of encounters that jump scale within the extraordinary that are framed, but are also framed within the extraordinary encounter of the violence of hijacking and the navies that patrol the ocean, that we see the workings of this economy of protection. As a unifying category, protection brings to the fore problems of moving across scale and temporality, and a theoretical understanding of encounters that exceed the binaries of colonizer, colonized, native, and settler, through which this question of encounter has often been theorized. Instead of parochial geographies tied to the terrestrial state, protection opens up an expansive imperial frame, which as Anne Stoller has noted, brings into view, in her words, imperial formations as supremely mobile politics of dislocation, dependent not on stable populations, but on movable ones. It is this politics and practice of mobility that this work has sought to sketch out through a focus on mothershipping in the Western Indian Ocean. 
the ambiguities of protection and its emphasis on everyday forms of recognition and engagement were underscored to me one afternoon during my last encounter with Jafan, who, had, who saw the sanctuary of the pirate skiff. I asked him what he remembered most about his time on board the Dow. Without a moment's pause, he answered, the food, the Indian food is too spicy for me. Thank you. Okay, I'll, great. Well, I'll, yeah, I'll just, uh, thanks, Farina. Um, yeah, no, it is very much, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this form of the shared moral universe of the Indian Ocean, which often is seen as either continuing to go, you know, with the coming of the Portuguese, or either it rapid, you know, radically transforms and is completely disrupted or continues on its own temporality. So part of what I've been trying to do here is look at, specific points that in fact you know frame this interaction so it is precisely the UN Security Council's mode of you know policing the Indian Ocean or policing the Red Sea that lead to this creation so the condition of possibility there the infrastructure that makes possible this engagement even between the mothership and the skiff is one that is framed within this imperial so so it's in fact precisely what I don't want to do is say that these are two separate worlds but that they are these moments of both intertwinement, but also in unintelligibility, right? So that moment when a pirate skiff approaches a Navy vessel and says, you have to take us. And, and the answer is, sure, we will disarm you and throw you out. And, you know, for, because, and we've given you five days worth of food and fuel, which works within, you know, w that we're safe within the kind of legal norms that we're operating under. So there, there is a misrecognition, a clear kind of, you know, misunderstanding in the, sort of Bohannon's way of thinking of imperial co conversations is always formed by mutual misunderstanding. So that's, that's kind of what I've been playing with and, and specifically here thinking about the idea of parasites, right? The various kinds of parasitism that happen between this Tao economy that is all, the t all of the time kind of rapidly being transformed by various imperial projects, but um, including you know, U.S. empire containerization is very much the mo if steam was to the British Empire, container ships are, you know, the, the sort of the ships of the U.S. empire. So, and it is precisely that point that, in fact, reinvigorates Gujarat and these Gujarati ports. So, so that's the relationship that I want to draw out here. Hi, Jen. Is this on? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm curious if you can say more about the term mothershipping and where it comes from and is that a translation from some other language because it seems that one of the, the themes that you're really interested in is relationality mm -hmm. and this is a kind of highly gendered form of relationality and it to my mind echoes you know the translation of motherland from other you know South Asian languages and it and you know motherland is also caught up in you know uh, ideas of jurisdiction and sovereignty and, and, and so forth, and it seems like there's some parallels. But in contrast to motherland, it seems like here we have kind of the, the mean mother 
And, and so I, I'm just, I'm wondering where this term comes from and where you're taking it from. Great, thanks Jeff. Um, yeah, I, can, I haven't actually, I think motherland would be an interesting way to kind of map on the mothership too. But so the mothership comes from 19th century whaling practices, right? So it, it was what whalers would use and it was a term that was used by whalers to talk of these larger ships that they would then go out, which would allow them to go from Hawaii all the way into the Pacific chasing whales. And, and within this context, it is, it is, uh, it is translated in from English into the various languages. So in Somali as well, it becomes mothership. It's not translated, it's just you know, sort of taken as mothership. So even the thou captain speak of this as we became mothershipped. And in the uh, and so th so that's there. In some ways, there is you know yeah. There's no reference to ma. There's no gendering of this category. And but I'm very interested in, in some ways, through a, you know obviously through working with Saris, but and also other places is trying to think of the kind of relationality and the sort of gendered logics that are at play. But but I really like the thinking of the motherland as well here. So thanks. Hey, I thought that was wonderful. Um, and I just wanted to say, to add on to the kind of gender issue because I was listening to you um, and the terms you were using talking about kind of an intimacy that starts off with coercion. It seems to me that you're talking about in symbolic terms, rape, right? Or forced marriage, where that you mm -hmm. have this kind of care work and we can't really judge whether it's real care work or not, but that begins in a moment of violence and then the, the AK-47 in the corner, right? Um, and I think it's quite interesting then in the anecdote you just gave where if they say we became mother shipped, then the ways in which you could think about these as moments of feminization, right? So it's not mm. so much about the maternity as the kind of, right, and if you think about patriarchy's collapse of the sexual and the reproductive roles of women, right? But I just bring that up if in terms of, if you can use sexual difference and questions of kind of coercion and consent to think about the relationships between these different types of ships, right? Um, and what whether that helps at all to think about this question of recognition, right? Because that kind of coercion consent thing that's happening across the line of sexual difference is not non-recognition. It's a hierarchical organization of differences that are, right, that are dependent on each other. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? But great talk, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Amrita, that I appreciate that. I mean, in some ways, the a thrust of this uh, argument comes from a reading of uh, Pitt Rivers and an older anthropological archive on bride capture and, and the kinds of socialities that are embedded within these forms of, you know, this, whether it's a practiced rape or other kinds of modes in which this, this gendered sexual difference plays out. So, so there's certainly, is I'll have to, you know, I wanna talk to you more in some ways about sexual difference and, because for me there is, like it is the move between, you know, moving from coercion and then the kind of emplacement of that coercion within a wider story of relationality that's ha that's at play here, at least in the narratives that I'm working with, right? So, so it's that beginning with this moment of coercive violence and then, because the AK-47 has to be kept aside. The, and so, so, yeah, so it'd be interesting to talk to you more about how that maps on or doesn't map on into a, f a world where protection is also deeply implicated, right? So the question of sexual difference, of sexual violence is one where this language of protection seeps in of safe spaces and other kinds of modalities. So it would be interesting to see where these map on. Stability. There is a community, and outsiders come, relations are established. 
this seems to be the opposite of what you're talking about in terms of mobility and these people knowing how to get along, even if they don't share a language. We've got this community of, of the old thing. So I must be missing something if there's something about a logical protection where the, the agent object the protector protectee dynamic is in a very different direction than the hospitality, the host guest uh, uh, relation. And both are characterized by some of these ambivalences you're talking about, mm -hmm. uh, the shaming of violence, you know, and things like that. But, uh, but it, the, the, your final emphasis on mobility and all of this, that's exactly what's not there for the ecological discussion about fatality. These are stable, landed places that have to deal with strangers. There's no shared moral universe. So I'm just confused. Thanks, uh, Lee. I, I guess part of maybe, the, so here I want to push back a little because I, I do think that, at least in my reading of Pitt Rivers and this anthropological literature, I think you're absolutely correct that there is an emphasis on the stranger, right? So in Meyer Fortas' essay on the stranger in African societies, but the stranger is one that there can, you know, there's, there's an ambivalence there. Like, yes, the, for the most part, the stranger is one that we do not know that comes from outside this moral universe. But at the same time, there's there's that tension between hospitality and hosting, and a world where one has to sometimes create strangers out of kin because having them too close is a form of danger as well. So this is, but you do, but you have forms of, co uh, you have forms of co-presence with kin that. Right. Mm -hmm. you know, right. I mean, guest, host, hostage, it's all the same word. Right. The ambivalence is there. And I think that's a very different ambivalence. It, it, it depends on a different social base than what you're talking about, if what you're talking about is as mobile, as mm -hmm. fluid as you're talking about. So I guess I'll ask you, if, if I may. Um, <laughs> Why would this mobility matter in, I mean, because in some ways, like part of the making, you know, part of imagining forms of hospitality is there, like, so I'm, I'm thinking of Andrew Shryock's work, right? So where, I right. And, and I, I see him also engaged in trying to understand those moments where this, this stranger is not as clearly defined. And, and that's part of the ambivalence that I'm playing with here, right? It is a shared moral universe one, but at the same time, it is sometimes also a universe where it, the hospitality is about a sensory form of, I don't smell diesel here, and that's my only relationship to this boat. So maybe I'm not being clear enough, but I, I think that there is, there are other kinds of ways in which one can imagine both the world of sort of, you know, th that is intimate but strange. And I think that's the duality that I'm playing with here. And maybe the duality that would help you. I'm just mm -hmm. No, I'm suggesting is to employ both a logic of stability and a logic of mobility, hmm. so that someone is a stranger and not a stranger, and right. trying to then structure those two kinds of things and you know the different implications of different kinds of ambivalence. Right. Rather than just because you're seeing an ambivalence, I think with violence and intimacy, you're seeing single phenomena. Right. No, I, I do, I'm not arguing for a single phenomenon here. So I should be, it's, it is in fact, like, so part of what I wanted to do with those, the idea of the boat as a sanctuary in an Islamic universe was about, was, is about kinship. It's about a different kind of relationship. But the fact that I want to be on this boat because it doesn't smell of diesel and I can watch movies and sit, sit down is not, does not need me to have, to exist in that shared moral universe with someone. It does not need me to have a pre-existing kin relationship. It is it is about an embodied form of like pleasure almost, of, or the non not being seasick. What this provides is stability. The boat becomes stable. So, so um, yeah, thank you, Lisa. 
Um, yeah, so I wanted to ask again about this uh, obligation to provide assistance at sea, which mm -hmm. you kind of mentioned a little bit in relation to Farina's question. Um, I guess I want to understand a little bit more whether that's something specific to your UN rules and jurisdiction um, or whether, um, I mean, I'm just curious about the roots of that and how that might be related to other forms of obligation that you're talking about as being a part of this moral universe or not, mm -hmm. um, just to have a better sense of that. Great, thank you. Um, on that, to that, I'm looking at specific aspects of maritime law um, that delineate. So in the US, it is an 1896, I think, act where the, uh, there, is, there is an obligation to provide assistance to ships that are, um, you know, that, that have essentially been rendered inoperable at sea. And it becomes, it comes up in uh, recent contexts over questions of interdiction of refugee boats. So there's a famous case in Australia where an Australian vessel does not take on board you know, a boat that's coming from Indonesia, and there was a huge moral uproar around this idea that they failed their obligation at sea. There have also been attempts by refugee groups to sue governments, in, to sue the EU and governments in Italy. There's a case going through the Hamburg Maritime Tribunal that's precisely about what kind of, you know, what kind of, what kind of obligation is there. And so, and states have used a very narrow reading of that because it is not tied to, it's not a natural law obligation in the sense it's, it is a very specific one to fellow seafarers. So they've all sometimes said that, you know, if passengers are not within this moral, or within this obligation, this legal obligation, and and part of that has to do with then the obligation of bringing them to land and having them processed through asylum and other kinds of you know, modes of defining what their legal status is. So that's why there has been a pushback. So so that's that's a debate that I'm also interested in juxtaposing alongside this encounter. Thank you for the talk. Um, just was wondering if you could talk a bit more about your use of the idea of a parasite um, and why why parasites? I mean, parasites are theoretically a thing that could be excised and removed entirely, and then the host could continue to exist. But you start the talk with some deep history about why piracy has kind of always been around. Um, in other in other debates about things like language, we there are those who think that thinking of language as something that has forms of communication which are parasitic on other forms of communication is not, not very helpful. So why in this case are you finding the idea of a parasite to be useful? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, so here I'm thinking specifically of Michael Saris's work on the parasite and where he argues in some ways for a third space that the parasite allows. So it's precisely the parasite. So he's interested in what he calls, you know, among other things, like this thing called abuse value. So a parasite is an organism that takes without giving. Can we, so can we imagine any kind of relationality to that organism other than wanting to excise it? And one of the things that he, he argues is that this parasite makes possible certain kinds of channeling that create temporary forms of relationships and also that the parasite is, is noise. It is always the background that exists. So he's, he plays with like six different forms of what parasite means. And I'm interested in at least two of those here, and and you know, something I'm thinking about what that relationship could be. So part of it is thinking outside of a framework of formality and informality within how we talk about economies at sea, and then the other is also thinking of what kind of rela you know, relationships of either hospitality or kinship, where the parasite as a figure can help disrupt certain assumptions that are inbuilt between those. Thanks, you gave a really great talk. Um, going back to this discussion of the hospitality part, I'm arriving at it from a slightly different set of um, scholarly works uh, in terms of distant suffering and what hospitality means in a mediated kind of environment. And in that scholarship, there's always a sense that proximity al also relies on, and especially hospitality, which comes in between strangers, or like Lee was saying, strange and not strange and so on also relies on maintaining a sense of proper distance. And so I was curious to hear if in these various interactions you observed, were there norms or ideas about maintaining proper distance between, let's say, the captain of a DAO and somebody who was 
hierarchically in a very lower position or between the naval vessel and then the person who's gra granted five days of food and water. What kinds of ideas about proper distance play out in the way in which they then decide, yes, I will be hospitable to this extent only and not much more, and do those shift depending on who's in question here? Let's say the person who boarded the vessel and re realized this is a predominantly uh, Muslim vessel and hence the notion of a proper distance might work differently as opposed to another situation. If you could say something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Certainly, I mean, part of what's happening in this encounter you know, across the, from the moment of arrival to departure is this negotiation and renegotiation of distance, right? So initially it is this seen as this moment of incomprehension here is this is danger, this is threat. It is not a jinn, it is a pirate, and now we have to deal with that. And and then what are the ways in which we can deal with the pirate? Do we deal is this, you know, someone who is wanting assistance or is this someone who is in fact and there are, there is also a distinction that is made in some of the interviews I did of those who actually want assistance, who are in fact lost and then are worthy of a kind of sympathy, and then others with whom that sympathy develops much later, right? You don't rescue. So there's, there's the language sometimes that comes of rescuing pirates from the sea versus being held hostage by them. So there, in, in all of those, depending on where, how one proceeds from the threshold down to departure, these forms of distances keep changing. Sometimes you don't give up your gun for four days, as opposed. Sometimes you give up your gun on the on the second day itself, and and then you know and and yes, there are pirates who would or people who would talk about being on ships where everyone was non-Muslim, and and there often is no mode of other than saying cook for me and clean. There's not much that happens there. So, so it's it's part of like you know there there is it is very contextual right it is worked out in the specificities of this encounter. Um, several of the stories are about moving in and out of being pirates. And I wonder if that correlates to any of the other variables, age, Muslim, Somali residents, um, or anything else that you can categorize them as a group, because that's one of the distancing mm -hmm. is, and I wonder if you ever came across a Dow crew where some of them had been ex-pirates. So in terms of the Dao crew of ex-pirates, not any. I mean, you have Dao crews who work for ex-pirates in the sense that pirates who made a lot of money then buy the Dao that they had <laughs> worked on. <laughs> and, and so there is that mode of recirculating within this world. And, and that is a very different kind of relationship. Um, but, but in terms of some of the other categories, I mean, pirate is the one where there's more ambiguity, right? And often because it is seen as, is it is it is it a raid? Is it something that's legible within this mode of thinking about the world, or is it just work? Can we make a connection through thinking of the pirate as as a worker like us at sea? So other the other categories less so. I mean, one, I at least in the interviews that I have, there is less. If one shows up on a boat where one is not Muslim, there is no further discussion of religion in that sense. There is, and and similarly, you know, the the idea of, and that's what I wanted to kind of emphasize that there is that distance that still remains, right? There is that difference. The for Rahimullah, the pirate is always Ali Baba. He's not a name. He is a, a type, a, sp a specific kind, and a, and a thief, right? That's <coughs> that there still is that mode. There isn't the, and then we became friends. There isn't. This doesn't end with a story of conviviality or friendship. It, it, it is. It sort of dissipates, and it's precisely its dissipation that, you know, that's interesting to me at least. And, and so within that framework, it is only what piracy is that matters. Other things. question. It was fascinating hearing a talk about hospitality and it was very 
uh, beautifully done. I wondered if you could actually say more about the concrete hospitality. Like, if you're thinking about somebody coming over, do they get the captain's bed? I mean, who gets to pick the <laughs> movies? I mean, what's what's the level of hospitality? I mean, I'm thinking also about the language, uh, to what extent they can communicate within detail, or <laughs> is it really grunting about food or something? Or do they really argue about which movie they're going to watch and, and who's going to sleep where? And, you know, all the kinds of things. Like, if you imagine... Like, give me the equivalent of having a guest in your house, and, and what is it like for these people when they have them over? Or do, do they give them special? And th th there isn't a special room in the hold for pirates. <laughs> uh, but but there, there is no pirate bedroom. Uh, but, <laughs> but part of it is, I mean, so, you know, these are two modes of when I was hosted on a Zao for a few days. So you have here the kitchen and... And oftentimes the stories are like, you know, someone walks in, they walk, they enter the, da the hold, they sit across from each other. You, s you sleep on the in that hold, in that same room. So you are sleeping approximately there, these DAOs, because they're packed with lots and lots of goods. So you can see, you know, in some of the earlier pictures, like you have trucks on board too. So everyone is crammed into the, into the hold. So, and... And oftentimes the arguments I would hear were on specifically the kind of food that was cooked and, and also on often discussions of, and it would be primarily sometimes Kachi Gujarati seafarers saying like, you know, we, when we would pray, they didn't quite do wudu properly. They don't, so there, there's also a marking of ethical self, like this is why they maybe became pirate, right? They, they aren't as good Muslims, but we still have, ja we can have Jummah together. And so there, there is this mode in terms of, so those are the places of contention. What kind of food is cooked? How we pray together? Not, not a whole lot of stories of where one sleeps. There is, and this is part of, I think, goes back to certain, certain erasures within narratives of wh what life at sea are, that kind of this moments of like male homosociality around sleep are disappear, whether on it's on stories of container ships or of DAOs. Like it's almost like no one's ever sleeping, which is not true, but but there are there's very little mention of that moment when one, where one was sleeping. I would ask that and they would just look at me and were like, <laughs> No. <laughs> I had overstepped about yeah, exactly. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, like what? What does that look like? Are you talking about the kinds of ships being used, or the goods being transported, or scale more in terms of distance and temporality? Like what sorts of scales are being jumped, and in in what ways is that connected to this question of formality and informality, and the fact that this entire world depends on that distinction that you were talking about between um, in the space that it is between the mm -hmm. formal and informal? Is there a connection there? Right, great. Um, thanks. So in terms of scale, there, it's in some ways all of the above, right? So it is, I'm thinking of scale both in the context of the move from, you know, imagining this relationship between the pirate and the Tao within this longer history of empire, within the kind of history of imperial engagements. It is also the jump of, the actual jump of scale from targeting fishing trawlers, charging a thousand dollars of ransoms to in the Red Sea to the move to the Western Indian Ocean, where you are talking about $2 million ransoms, where you're talking about you know, the need for a mothership. So there's a jump in scale in terms of the complexity of the economy, the market that emerges around protection, around sort of holding something hostage. Because you can't, you know, one of the things that I learned was that, you know, there's not a whole lot you can do with a container ship if you just commandeer one you have it has to be channeled within certain worlds of value extraction right so who owns one is often a mystery so where do you how do you find out where to even begin negotiation so it's this scale in the sense of also the shift within the economy of piracy but also scalar shifts in terms of the kinds of relationships that I'm talking about here from you know that moment at the threshold to departure so and and yes, it has a relationship, and and within the Dao economy too, right? So if you look at this history of um, an economy that's working at the margins, to one that, especially as 
container shipping transforms this world, creating certain ports and ships that cannot go to certain ports, right? It's so, so there, this DAO economy has always has to operate at that, at a scale below this. So there, there's a, almost a, a relationship of necessity between these. That's so. I mean, sometimes there will be people, often, you know, who would quote at length various, and you know, this is a phenomenon all throughout East Africa, right? I mean, even West Africa. Brian Larkin talks about this, the, the kind of the aesthetic qualities of Bollywood travel, and so there would be people who had an encyclopedic knowledge of film, and language through film. So, so there were moments where someone would talk of the, pir you know, like sort of serenade a Dao from a Bollywood movie, and and, <laughs> and and so and these moments, and so so it was that it was shared in that very literal sense that they both had liked Amitabh Bachchan, and or it would be simply just what's called you know, a moment of just spending time together and boredom, and this is something that I do in my larger work. Boredom is a very key aspect of all sorts of work at sea. So it is work at sea is is hard work, it, but it also is, there's a lot of waiting, there's boredom, so part of what one does when one is bored, and, and often what I did for the three days that I was on this boat was, oftentimes we watched films that were you know, dubbed in some other language, you know, they were actually like dubbed into Hausa, and, uh, and we just stared at them, and so there was no, <laughs> like, yeah, so that was, so there's that mode of being together. for uh, something to drink, indeed, and uh, let's one more time thank you.